The following video is brought to you by Worthless, the young person's indispensable guide to choosing the right major by Aaron Clary. The postmodern adventures of Kill Team One book series by Mike Leone. The Adventures of Morgala by John David. All of our wonderful fans on Patreon and viewers like you. Thank you. The following is a world class bullshit as exclusive. Meet Scott Mendelson, smarmy douche and critic respected by none. In an attempt to accelerate the current anger of the Star Wars fan to menace, he posts useless articles discussing the state of Star Wars while continually calling The Last Jedi the best Star Wars film in 38 years. This is a cry for attention, a cry for help. Scott Mendelson, in his never-ending battle with failing relevance and a dipping libido, attempts to goad fans into a blind rage. But that's not going to happen. We're winning this war, and Solo is the first casualty. Scott Mendelssohn's time is up. He thinks he treads heavily in the real world, but unbeknownst to him, Scott Mendelssohn has taken his first step into a larger world. His first step into the Twilight Zone. It's been a while since I've talked about our friend Scott Mendelssohn, mainly because I've been on a stupidity cleanse. But when I see an article like this that is such a cry for attention, I do what I do when I hear a crying baby. See what all the fuss is about. The fuss is all for naught. Because over on his shrinking corner of the internet, Scott Mendelssohn has officially lost it. In his newest piece of crap, Scott Mendelson attempts to brush aside the factors for a failing Star Wars and assure us that all is well. Oh, Scott, you delusional bastard. Before I eviscerate that lame article, let me discuss why Scott Mendelson is wrong, even before I tell you what he said. I never knew what it was like to experience this SJW cultural terrorism firsthand until it infected Star Wars. As you know, the last few months have been... weird. The fans who don't like The Last Jedi are being labeled, targeted, and harassed. You know, all those terrible things they claim we do. There's never been a movie that's caused this type of problem before. If you're like me, and you've been expressing your displeasure with the film since it debuted, you've heard all the spin, all the hatred, all the negativity. Moreover, you've seen every excuse fall apart each and every step of the way. Remember the Russian bots? Sarcasm or not, Rotten Tomatoes went out of their way to confirm that the votes were real for The Last Jedi. Remember the accusations about Kelly Marie Tran's harassers? Still, nothing confirmed. Yet, we had a stern talking to by the voice of reason, Ryan Johnson. Remember the time the fans said enough is enough and stayed home from Solo, ignored the merchandise, and created an online movement that no matter how the media tries to spin it, fails? Oh, I remember. You see, folks, with every single day, some new bullshit arises from the Lucasfilm camp. Be it from them or their cronies, someone is ready to die on the sword for The Last Jedi. You'd think they'd want people to just forget about it and move on. But every day they pick a new fight with us, and yeah, I said us. We're a unified front at this point. That's the reason this is happening. What is this? You don't know what this is. Well, do you know Kathleen? <sighs> you do? Well, let's share with the class. It's your going away party. We hope. So last week, Grace Randolph released a video that discussed the rumored meeting between Kathleen Kennedy and Disney about the security of her job. I'm not going to give you a point-by-point -point recap. You can watch the video for yourself. But the long story short is... Kathleen Kennedy is in deep shit. Now, we say rumored because no official confirmation has come out yet, but, by that same token, nothing official denying it has come out either. What's most important about this whole situation is that the cracks are beginning to show. This Kathleen Kennedy dumpster fire didn't come out of nowhere, and it's not an isolated incident. Last week, news came out that the Star Wars anthologies were cancelled. And then they weren't. Then it said that some are further along in the pipeline, and they aren't cancelled. And then it came out that Obi-Wan Kenobi may be in Episode Nine, And then it came out that Obi-Wan's film may debut on Disney's new streaming service. It's all a bunch of maybe this and maybe that, but the only guaranteed thing that's currently happening is that it's falling to pieces right in front of their eyes, and soon Kathleen Kennedy and her jabroni cronies will be buried alive. The big takeaway from all this confusion over at Lucasfilm is that they're failing to find something that works fast, because they've shit the bed one too many times for mom to just toss out the sheets. The whole room is contaminated, and it needs to be cleansed by fire. Kathleen Kennedy is the problem, no matter how the woke mafia want to spin it, it's her fault Solo flopped. It's her fault Ryan Johnson got away with Star Wars treason. It's her fault that J.J. Abrams is scraping up a finale from the ashes of the worst Star Wars film ever. They, the woke mafia, can't deny the entertainment business is just that. A business. And the customer demands more. But my god are they trying to deny us. An enlightened tweet, sarcasm, from Geek Girl Diva states that you are not a customer of either Lucasfilm or Star Wars. You may be a customer of Hasbro or Del Rey, or any number of licensees, but buying a movie ticket doesn't make you a customer unless it's of the theater you bought the ticket from. You do not own Lucasfilm Limited or the Star Wars franchise. 
just when I think you couldn't possibly be any dumber. You go and do something like this. Besides trying to get her name involved in the biggest online topic since Gamergate, what is Geek Girl Diva doing? Absolutely nothing. She's trying to split hairs by finding the lamest way to protect Lucasfilm from criticism. We're not customers of Lucasfilm or Star Wars, but we may be customers of Hasbro. Um, Geek Girl Diva, no one is a customer of Hasbro's Star Wars anymore. Images like this prove it. Kids don't want this crap. People like you and Pablo Hidalgo hide behind the excuses that kids only want technology to play with. Well, if that's the case, your insider information from Hasbro must know that too. Yet they still produce this crap. I wonder why. They know the demographic who actually buys the merchandise. It's that same demographic that people like Ryan Johnson constantly attack online. That same demographic is why Episode 7 had X-Wings and TIE Fighters, why Han Solo and Luke Skywalker were around, why they recycled the same plots from pre-existing films. Nostalgia. They milk them for the nostalgia, and so when they dislike something, they're called the worst things possible. That demographic allowed Disney to make a few billion dollars by being lazy and lacking any semblance of creativity because of the past. But when Disney went to the well this time, it failed. Shitting on your fans is bad, but shitting on your customers is worse. No matter how they try to spin it, we are the ones who pay for everything. And by everything, I mean that we pay for the product with our money, and we also pay for their creatively bankrupt ideas and ideals that have failed our beloved franchise. Literally every other company that produces something refers to us as customers, at least publicly, and Lucasfilm Disney is no different. Get your heads out of your asses. Speaking of ass, the face of this failure, Ryan Johnson, has to make an obligatory appearance in this video. Sorry, but hey, he won a Saturn Award, so that's something. Something stupid. Ryan Johnson won the equivalent of an MTV Movie Award for the best kiss. A bunch of fangirls will spaz out, but you know it's a hollow victory. It's essentially an entertainment participation award. You'll try to bring up the fifth Saturn Awards, where Star Wars dominated the show. But when you look back, Star Wars isn't remembered for winning a Saturn Award. It's remembered like this. It, Star Wars, received 10 Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, winning seven. It was among the first films to be selected as part of the U.S. Library of Congress's National Film Registry as being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. At the time, it was the most recent film on the registry, and the only one chosen from the 1970s. In 2005, the British Film Institute included it in their list of 50 films you should see by the age of 14. Its soundtrack was added to the U.S. National Recording Registry in 2004. Today, it is regarded as one of the most important films in the history of motion pictures. How is The Last Jedi remembered? Not well. But good for Ryan. If he's proud of that creatively bankrupt terror he's created, let's let him have it. He's not doing too well, guys. Just take a look at the release footage of his personal life. Yeah. It's rough for that little round-headed rapscallion. Now, back to the opener, Scott Mendelson. Scott put out yet another nonsensical article titled, Star Wars 9's Big Problem Won't Be The Last Jedi's Backlash or Solo's Failure. It's not worth a read no matter how compelled you are to stare at a car wreck, so I'll just give you the quick and dirty. <laughs> Scott starts out this vomit-inducing work by saying, For the record, Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi is arguably the best Star Wars movie since The Empire Strikes Back, and whatever fate awaits Star Wars 9 in December of 2019, the biggest challenge won't be the reception of this Star Wars movie, or solo a Star Wars story. Now you could read this as one of two ways. Star Wars is still kicking ass, or Star Wars isn't what it once was. And there's more possibilities that the next film could flop harder than Solo. The good news slash bad news for Solo regarding the Star Wars franchise is that it bombed because audiences didn't want to see it. Not because they were appalled by The Last Jedi or because they're now boycotting Star Wars. The Last Jedi still aren't rave pre-release reviews. Let's stop you right there, Valley Girl. Rave pre-release reviews? Rave pre-release reviews! How is that now a way to quantify a film was positively received? Let's look back to 2016 and see how a little gem called Suicide Squad fared after being called Perfect and the hit DC Comics needed. Oh, Scott. That is a real fucking disingenuous way to stack your argument. Pre-release reviews mean jack shit. The John Campies of the world contribute to shit like that, and they're what is known as, um, what's the word? Shills! Back to Scott gushing over The Last Jedi. Solid opening weekend audience reception and a halfway decent 2.8 times multiplier for a $620 million domestic, about the same amount from The Force Awakens 936 million gross as Empire Strikes Back though from Star Wars, and the film's $1.3 billion worldwide queue is still $1.3 billion. Everyone obsessed with superhero fatigue in the summer of 2015, 
when Marvel's Avengers Age of Ultron only earned $1.4 billion, three years later, Avengers Infinity War just crossed the $2 billion worldwide. Well, Scott, where was this type of fan backlash from an MCU flick? The only people I recall talking about superhero fatigue were self-righteous asshats and people who weren't fans to begin with. Also, I don't remember Kevin Feige or Robert Downey Jr. or Joss Whedon coming out openly to piss on the fans. Plus, the first Avengers made $1.5 billion. The second, $1.4 billion. Star Wars The Force Awakens made $700 million more than The Last Jedi. The drop between Avengers and Age of Ultron is very small. Here it's the fans of Star Wars that are fed up with this crap. Not some invisible hate group that people are trying to create or disrupt the movement against the garbage pumped into Star Wars. At the very least, the one and a half year gap between Ron Howard's Solo and J.J. Abrams' Star Wars Episode 9 will circumvent any franchise overload. Moreover, whatever demographic will stay home due to their dissatisfaction with The Last Jedi will be countered by the folks who show up because of the third and final chapter of this new trilogy. I disagree, Scott. The Empire Strikes Back ended on a cliffhanger that shocked the world, to which Return of the Jedi had to resolve, and Revenge of the Sith promised to tell the story the fans have been wanting to know for decades, how Anakin became Darth Vader. What does Episode 9 have in store for us? What did Episode 8 leave us wondering? The answer to both of those questions is nothing. Episode 9 doesn't get to coast on the historic performance of Return of the Jedi and Revenge of the Sith because of the previous trilogies built towards something. People were on the edge of their seats, eager with speculation for three years, the Last Jedi ended with a cinematic equivalent of a wet fart in church, and what always follows stinks. Whether or not J.J. Abrams is able to make a third flick that makes both Force Awakens and Last Jedi fans happy is an open question, but it'll still be the ninth and possibly final saga in the ongoing Skywalker slash Solo story. It would be like dedicated MCU fans staying home from Avengers 4 because they didn't like Avengers Infinity War or Ant-Man and the Wasp. Would it... People aren't skipping Solo because it sucked. People skipped it to send a message. The Chinese skipped it and The Last Jedi because they hate this Baizu crap out of Hollywood. And that new woke audience, the people that you're trying to desperately believe exist, didn't see it and won't go see Episode 9. Outside of Scott having a literary hissy fit, he does bring up one good point, and that's the sole reason why I included him in this video. The biggest threat to Star Wars 9's final global gross isn't Star Wars fatigue, fan backlash, or any other potentially non-existent variables. It's the sheer amount of big movies opening in November slash December of 2019. November alone will see Warner Brothers' Wonder Woman 1984, Sonic the Hedgehog, James Bond 25, Terminator's Reboot, Frozen 2, and Walt Disney's Star Wars Episode 9. Wicked and Sony's Jumanji 3 are likely to possibly open around Episode 9's December 20th release. That's an advantage Star Wars can no longer count on. When you put Spider-Man against Attack of the Clones or Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle against The Last Jedi, or Sing against Rogue One, the numbers go down. Well, Scott makes a decent point there. Too bad he ended the article with yet another attempt to go to fan base into anger. Outside of Scott's pitiful attempt at being humorous, the competition does arise from the fact that Star Wars is no longer the only game in town. But what should worry them, Disney, Lucasfilm, Scott Mendelson's husband, is that Star Wars could have the advantage Scott spoke of, but through garbage decisions and piss-poor fan relations, they won't. Star Wars has made its bed, and it has to line its piss-soaked sheets. Yes, it's not the only game in town, but when competition arises, you'd think they'd do their best to keep everyone happy, while finding that happy medium to draw in the new crowd. Lucas had that magic. I found Star Wars in 1995, two years before the special editions and four years before the prequels, when there was nothing new, so it's definitely possible that keeping a franchise true to its roots will attract that next generation of fans. It did me and millions of people out there who were too young for Return of the Jedi, but fans before The Phantom Menace. Instead, we're left with a situation where no one's happy. So Star Wars will die. It's been a good run, folks. See you on the other side. But if you think that was all coincidental, you'd be wrong. I found this pretty interesting article titled Phases of Geekergate, and tomorrow I'll be back to break it down to show you how it relates to Star Wars and how we are where we are now. So thank you to everyone who watched this video. I greatly appreciate it. Make sure you give it a thumbs up and share it. Tell everyone about World Class Bullshitters. If you're a super fan of this channel, make sure you join our Patreon page. A buck a month goes a long way. Five bucks, which is only 17 cents a day, goes even further. Gives you access to all of our digital content, our monthly patron hangouts, all kinds of stuff. Questions to be read on air, you can even appear on the show, depending on what level you are. So Patreon is an awesome way to interact with World Class Bullshitters that you can't get anywhere else. But if you can't afford that, that's not a problem. Just watch the videos and let everyone know you're a fan. 
Make sure you guys come back tomorrow for more Good Morning Pop Culture. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who watches that show, this show, everything we do here on the channel. It's been a great couple of months, and we're going to keep moving forward. By the way, folks, if you heard the opening of this video and you want to advertise on World Class Bullshitters, shoot us an email, worldclassbs at mail.com, and we'll talk, because you can reach over half a million people each month. So, in closing, what do you think about Scott Mendelson? Do you think he's lost at this time? Did he ever have it to lose in the first place? To me, he's the journalism equivalent of John Campia, just a waste of time. Yet, I make videos about him because he's good for a laugh. So, thank you, Scott. I'm pretty sure you've heard every video I've ever made about you. And if you haven't, and this is the first one, I implore you, go back and listen to what else I've had to say about you. It's quite interesting. But folks, as always, let me know what you think of the situation down in the comments below. Let me know what you think of Scott Mendelson down in the comments section below. Does it change your opinion of Forbes? I know they say that this writer does not reflect the opinions and views of Forbes, but you know what? It colors my opinions and views of Forbes, no matter what disclaimer they put down there. So... Scott's kind of doing more damage for an entire publication than he's doing any good. But I'm not advocating for Scott to be fired, because Scott does have the right to speak his opinions. But I have the right to tell him I think he's wrong. But again, thanks to everyone who watched this video, and I'll be back later with more. By the way, folks, quick addition to this video. After I recorded it, I got confirmation that World Class Bullshitters is going to be live at Horror Hound Indianapolis on August the 24th through the 26th. So if you're just dying to meet us, come up to Indianapolis, hang out with us, have a couple beers, if you're age appropriate, and have a good time. We're going to be there all weekend. We're going to be telling stories, giving out free stuff. It's going to be the first of many live world-class bullshitters events. So if you're in the Midwest and you can make the trip, please do. You're not going to regret it.